Hey, it's Chris, Luger Games. Let's talk Rolling Realms, the latest game from Stonemaier. Now, this has been out for a little while as more of a print and play, but this is the official printed version of it. So what do you need to know? If you're not familiar with it, what does it entail as a roll and write? How is it different than other stuff out there? What does it do well? What doesn't it do as well? What did I like about it? What didn't I like about it? And overall, sort of where does it fall in the realm of those things? So if you're interested, let's do this. Let's check out Rolling Realms. Let's take a look. Now, with Rolling Realms, like I said, the print and play is already out. And so the basic concept of this is you have these nine cards, these nine individual boards that are the same for any and all players. This is a one to six player count game in terms of roll and rights, where, I mean, it's very similar to the rest. I mean, the concept is you roll two dice, use those numbers, allocate them to the cards in front of you, rinse and repeat to collect resources to score points. Now, how it does this, the manner in which it does this is uniquely different. I won't go into the full rules. I think that's boring. The gist of it is you have three of them in front of you. Any three you want, you can pick them, you can randomly choose them, you can do however you want. You play that through nine rounds, nine turns done simultaneously, score them, move on to the next set, move on to the next set, so you have three sets of three. Most points at the end wins. It's that simple, right? Well, kind of. So the gist of the game is all of these tiles are titled names of games of other Stonemeyer productions. Tapestry, Scythe, My Little Scythe, Viticulture, all of those sorts of things. And they all have different mechanisms in how you can earn the star victory points. I won't go into all of the details of them, for the most part, they're self-explanatory. The concept of this game is relatively simple. You have your dice, you take them, you roll them, you allocate them. So in this case, I have a five and a two. In these three ones, we have Tapestry, Pendulum, and Between Two Cities. So I can choose to allocate these two dice in any of the two of the three areas that I'd like. Now, Tapestry, it's straightforward. The die equals the number of spaces that you fill in. As you complete the squares, you get the resource, you mark the resource off in your card. Pendulum is a little bit trickier, but nothing too terribly difficult. Now, anytime you complete one of these uh, hourglasses, you get how many of these are circled. And so you can choose to either do up here or allocate a die to circle up here. And then between two cities is also very straightforward. You choose to allocate a die into a row or a column into one of the squares. You cannot have the same number orthogonally next to itself. Then they all score based on obviously the number of stars you have when you fill one of these, the number of stars here with tapestry of the rows and the columns that are completely filled squares. And then going back to between two cities, it scores the number of stars, like it says, equal to the lowest score of the other two. But it can't be higher than the number of filled in squares as a whole. So I have five and I have two. Very straightforward. Let's say I just want to do a two here. So I'm going to just take a two and fill in these two pumpkins right there. And then maybe I'll take my five and put it right there. Actually, you know what? In this case, we'll circle one of these stars because I want one of those stars instead when I fill in one of these. That's round one, especially when I'm doing solo. Then I just take the dice again, re-roll again, roll off camera, get a four and a three. So I could allocate one to here. Now there are special abilities that you're going to have in these situations based on the number of resources because each of the resources will give you slightly different ways to mitigate. Here is the full table of what all of these symbols do. I mean, the pumpkins are gonna add or remove a number plus or minus one to each of the dies that you wanna use. The hearts are going to allow you to gain an extra die, a virtual, uh, theoretical die that you can use again to a different area. However, if you use more of them, uh, you can use uh, them slightly better. And then the coins there, you can gain a die of value equal to, obviously, whatever it says along there, and it gives you an example. So, I mean, the resources are relatively straightforward. 
Uh, there's nine of these different cards. These are three of the more straightforward ones and the easy ones. There's a couple more that I mentioned that are a little bit more complex, but nothing too terribly difficult. Again, if I wanted to say, take my three, you know, I could do the three here, one, two, three. Oh, all of a sudden I've got this one filled in. I've got a pumpkin. I'd go over and I'd mark my pumpkin off. And then I take my four. You know what? Maybe I put my four over here because I'm trying to evenly distribute and I'm trying to get uh, some of these to match up with these. So you would do that nine times in a round, or if you're doing a special solo, depending on what it tells you to do uh, on that hole, you're going to you know follow those rules as well. So what did I like about this game? First off, the solo is super unique. If you're looking for a solo roll and write that does something different in terms of the solo aspect of things versus like the group play side of things, this is probably, you know, I'm not a big roll and write person, but this does a really different, really unique, really well thought out and executed job where they have made an 18 hole golf course, essentially with pars and specific rules on each hole to say, this is what you need to do. These are the three cards you need to use. These are the special rules. This is what you need to score in order to get the whole done. And then it also gives you a par, you know, in the sense of, well, par is two. You have two attempts to get this done, to be on par from a golfing perspective. So lower is better. Less attempts to get it is better. Less attempts means you get a better job in the first place. And they range in complexity, they range in variability, they range in everything of that regard in terms of starting uh, values and resources and you know everything from that side of things. So that is by far and away probably the biggest plus. I say that as a non-solo person too. Like I'm not against solo stuff, but most of the time it's just a slight twist on you know the rest of the game so it's not really anything to write home about it's just you're somehow you know two-handing it or mitigating it just slightly to make it no this is this is completely different in that sense and sometimes you'll have the full nine turns and sometimes they'll give you seven sometimes they'll give you anywhere th in between and so it's unique it's nice it's a test you can play it score it. you can play as many of those 18 holes as you want it's time consuming if you're going to play all 18 because especially if you don't get it done on the first shot. So again, biggest pro for me, biggest thing I could see people, especially on the solo side of things, looking for something unique and different, that is it. The other pro, I mean, it's Stonemeyer, right? The quality control is there, it's great. It's small box size, you can see it sitting right here. It's not big, fits on the shelf nicely, goes well from that side of things, no complaints about that. that you know, can be said about all of their games from that side of things. Other big pro, I mean, it's a little bit of a step up at the same time. You know, you've got three resources that you're managing that all do slightly different things. And it's not just as simple as something like, uh, you know, one of my other favorites, let's make a bus route. Or it's not as simple definitely as cartographers. It is a notch up from those simpler side of things. So if you're looking for something that is sort of next level, something that's not fully introductory, but something that gives you just enough, you know, more twist, more thinking on that side of things, this is also a good bridge to that as well. So what didn't I like? Honestly, I didn't like the rule book. Now that I've played a couple Stonemeyer games, I do not like the rules in terms of how they are set up. It gives you sort of this brief synopsis and then it gives you an example, and then it gives you how to actually play. Like, I am a person where I want to give me step by step how to play turn by turn, action by action. That is how my brain works. It's not this sort of disjointed, first put this in there, then show me an example of stuff. I don't even, you haven't even introduced what the resources do yet, but you're telling me, okay, well then you can do this with this resource and you can mitigate this and this card, well, this is what you're gonna do. You haven't told me what the cards do yet because that's two pages later. What these realms are all, you know, how they score and how they're different and what you're doing. Well, I don't know when you give me an example on page two. So that was a little frustrating. I mean, it's not difficult to learn, but it's like, why, why organize it that way? 
if I'm somebody completely new to this and someone recommends this to me and I don't have a whole lot of board gaming experience, that's not going to make a whole lot of sense to me. So it's again, it's a barrier to entry. It's a small thing, but it's a big thing when you're someone who's not as used to learning new games all the time. And anything that prevents it from getting to the table easier is a problem from that side of things, especially with a mass market-ish game that this is, I'm thinking, trying to beat. So as small as that is, that's also significant. The other you know, thing I didn't like is there's two or three of these realms that are not well explained, that are not well worded, that I can see or that I feel like no one said, hey, let's explain this in a different way. Hey, have someone who hasn't play tested this try to explain this to someone else. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're not overly complicated, but the Charter Stone one and the Scythe one in particular are definitely a little bit a uh, degree above in terms of trying to understand them. You know, the Scythe one is relatively straightforward once you see it in action once or twice, but the Charter Stone one still at times is a little bit difficult to make sure I'm doing it right. Like I'm reading the rules three or four times, and the problem is the rule book doesn't explain it any different than the card does in terms of how it's actually utilized. So again, it's like, you know, if you don't understand it one way, well, I'll go check it elsewhere. No, it's explained the same way elsewhere, which then forces you to go look up a video or look up a rules explanation. And, you know, again, it's a barrier to getting it to the table. If I have to try and figure it out every time I play, especially if I don't play it that often, is that going to prevent me from wanting to play it if I can't easily explain one of the cards to everyone every time? It's something to consider. But there are some very clever, you know, on the opposite side of things, different use of, you know, polyomino shapes or the circle up here, but you only get it when you filled in the hourglass down here, sort of the pendulum side of things with that game. So I appreciate it because it's not taking all of the similar tropes that we see exactly elsewhere with some of these other cards. It is trying to make them different, but... Like I mentioned, those two in particular are a little bit more miss for me than hit. So where are my final thoughts? Uh, what do I think about it? I mean, again, it's different than other roll and rights. I'm not a huge roll and write person in general, but I think it does something different and unique enough with the nine different realms of things that it's worth looking at and it's worth giving a shot because you can make some cool combinations, you can make some very weird hard combinations as well, and it just depends on game to game. So if you like that sort of thing, that is, you know, and that's the downside of a lot of the other rolling rights. That's the downside of let's make a bus route. That's a downside of cartographers is, you know, you can't play them, you know, four or five times in a row probably because they get, you know, let's be frank, a little bit samey. They do. And that's and that's okay. It means you bust it out every once in a while, but otherwise, you know, it's not something I want to play two or three times in a row on a single night. Whereas with this, I definitely could. Because you're going to have significantly different outcomes. There is a little bit, though, of analysis paralysis. And if you don't want a little bit of analysis paralysis in your role and rights, which in general speaking, are tending to be a little bit more on the lighter side of things, this may be just slightly too heavy for you. I mean, that's okay. But you need to be aware from that side of things as well. This is not going to be as widely appealing as a few of those others that are have a little bit lower overhead in terms of explaining. And that's okay. I don't think it's meant to be. But you just need to know that before going in. So, there you go. That is Rolling Realms. Interested? Well, let me know. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you've played it. Let me know what you think. Let me know what questions you have now that I've got a physical copy on hand to play with and check it out a little bit more. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks for clicking. Hopefully you subscribe if you like it. As always, stay classy. I'll see you around.